Okay, so um, I'm, I may as well get things uh, started here. So uh, just a really quick introduction from us. I'm Philip Awadala. Um, I'm here in Toronto at the University of Toronto and the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. And um, with uh, Thomas Keane and Melanie Curteau, uh, we uh, lead and support the data, uh, the data st uh, uh, standards and, inf and infrastructure working group. And today I'm joined by Helen Parkinson, uh, uh, with regard to leading this roundtable or discussion. So Helen, I'm going to allow you to uh, introduce yourself, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see some familiar names and meet some new people. Um, I'm Helen Parkinson from the European Bioinformatics Institute, where I lead the knowledge management section. And my interest really in IHCC is as a user of the infrastructure, but also a, a resource that collects some of the cohort data that's derived um, in terms of things like polygenic scores and summary statistics. And then we try and make those integrated into other resources. Thank you, Helen. So, um, so that's great. So we're going to be leading a discussion this morning about uh, that's and is intentionally positioned at the end of this meeting to, uh, to some extent, recap some of what we've heard over the last uh, three or four days. It's been a long couple of days, but we've heard a lot of interesting things about what uh, could the data structures and infrastructure working group support and, and uh, how our activities uh, could be steered as it relates to our um, our, our strategic plan. So I'm going to get things rolling uh, with regard to starting off our discussion today with a very quick kind of, uh, uh, and I hope everybody can see the slides, um, of, uh, of, of a quick recap of, of material that you've already heard Thomas present um, earlier in, in, in this meeting. Um, and so some of these slides you've seen before, they were developed by Thomas, Melanie, and Carlos Garcia. Um, and so, but the point being though that uh, we want to take you know what we've done thus far and develop upon it. And what are the what do, what do we need to do that? So I'll be acting as the scribe and helping lead the discussion later on. And there'll be a report back session after our discussion today as well. So uh, again, just uh, this is sort of the mandate of the of the uh, data in, uh, standards and infrastructure group uh, to make uh, deliver interoperable cross corridor infrastructure to enable population scale biomolecular data to be accessible across international borders. Um, so our aims are, gen are increased cohort data reuse and sharing. So Thomas walked us through some of the FAIR principles, of course, um, create a global platform for cross cohort uh, scientific research and aligning with other global standards uh, to maximize interoperability. So one of the flagship activities, one of the flagship activities of the IHCC and our working group of, is of course the build of the Atlas. So, uh, you know, we, we got an update as to where we are with the Atlas now. And so you can really see here that, and it's exciting to see that we've got at varying levels or depths of information, um, many more cohorts than we were say even just a year ago, already been uploaded into the IHCC Atlas. Um, and so uh, we had an update here. You've got, you've got some, we've got many more cohorts, 67 more um, that have given us uh, significant information. Uh, I encourage you to go to the link take a look at what's in there. It certainly would help us understand as to what we could also uh, improve upon naturally uh, with this. And so this is a lot of great work that um, Melanie's been driving out of the OICR as well. And so we're very grateful for that activity. And of course, you know, we, we heard from Thomas about how, uh, how IHCC member uh, cohorts could potentially um, uh, incorporate uh, uh, their data uh, and share their data dictionaries with the IHCC as well. Now, uh, what we also heard uh, from um, uh, uh, earlier this week is what the five-year vision is. And uh, so, uh, you know, these speak, this five-year vision isn't terribly different than where we started off with back in 2017, where, you know, we wanted to build that atlas such that we make data, uh, make the uh, variables that many of the cohorts that are members of the IHCC make that that make that make those variables visible, um, identify commonalities is where we want to be going next among those different cohorts. Um, and then of course, develop infrastructure uh, such that we enable pan cohort or cross cohort as well as individual cohort, but really I would think cross cohort um, activities. Uh, each of these cohorts that our members probably have uh, an existing infrastructure to enable access uh, to the cohorts. Uh, but I think really one of our our, 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 our um, priorities is to support pan cohort or global 
uh, analyses of data. So I started off, um, so we, we've been instructed by the IHCC to fill out a table like this and report back um, uh, as to uh, uh, how can the data standards and infrastructure working group, what have we learned through the summit? Um, are there funding opportunities can, that can support um, the, our, our activities? What could they be? What could we do to support some of the other cohorts who are members to also be part of the IHCC publication and collaboration opportunities and actionable priorities as well? So I'll, I will be acting as the scribe um, for today's discussion. I'm hoping that the uh, that all of us will be able to kind of uh, 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 give us some thoughts or your, your thoughts as to uh, what we could do uh, as a working group. Um, I thought I'd start off with some of my own thoughts here. Um, so uh, in terms of trying to make the five-year vision a reality, there are some natural, I thought, um, uh, activities uh, that we could be uh, uh, looking for, uh, uh, you know, th things that we need to make this five-year vision a reality. Funding is naturally one of them. Uh, cohort engagements is also something that we're active in. Uh, part of cohort engagement should be data harmonization, harmonizing our high level, uh, the dictionaries uh, with the, of the variables that, and so we need those data dictionaries from the cohorts. Uh, partnerships with potentially other existing international cohort activities, um, proof of principle projects uh, as well. So if we are in the goal of enabling international cohort science, there may be a couple of projects that we would like to support that are directly using the pi the uh, our our uh, our portal, um, and then something I think we can also discuss, of course. And we heard we had a full uh, morning, uh, not a full morning, but a couple of sessions talking about uh, internet uh, collaboration with um, both industry and potentially commercial providers as well. Um, so, you know, those are some thoughts um, that I thought uh, could help start with some of the discussion. Um, and I'm going to come back to this slide here. And Helen, I'm going to turn it over to you to some extent, um, if you've got any thoughts or additions that you'd like to add to uh, what, what we've just heard from me. Yeah, thank you very much, Philip. So, so I guess I'll expand a bit on some of the things that we're doing and how we're using IHCC and how, how that would be, um, how that could be extended to make it more usable for us. So, so I love the fact that IHCC is aggregating data and making it available. It's incredibly useful for us. We are quite often trying to map data to two cohorts. So we will have some derived data from a cohort, sometimes one or more cohorts. It's quite often a genome-wide association study, and there's perhaps been some replication, or it's been a data set that's gone into a polygenic school or something else. We really want to link when we have data, we assign accession numbers to our data, we make them available, we track where they go through other resources. We'd really like to link back to IHCC. We'd like to map our accessions back onto IHCC and say, we think that this data set is derived from this cohort. So I think there's some value there to have this kind of secondary derived data available for the community and show where it came from. Um, but we have a particular problem of uniquely identifying cohorts. And we try to mine these from the publications that people give us. And it's really, really difficult to mine them in any kind of automated or semi-automated way. So if there were a set of um, identifiers that cohorts could ask people to use when they're publishing, that would mean we'd be able to link the secondary data back really cleanly and we'd know what we're dealing with. It's not always a completely clean situation because sometimes people pull data from different cohorts for different kinds of analyses, but that would help us kind of understand which cohorts there are. And because of the work IHCC has done already, we're in much better shape for actually understanding which cohorts are out there. The desire to add more from your side is great because we have coverage that we'd like. And we've got a list of, I guess, more hundreds of, of resources and cohorts that were available that we could share with you and say, well, we know people are generating these kinds of data for these. Um, one other thing that we try and do is we'd like to link up to other data sets. So all of the data that we hold is either curated from publications or it's deposited as summary statistics. Um, we want people to do that. Um, we want to make that deposition happen. So if cohorts were able to say, you know, other data sets are going here, it would be great. Not all data sets can be open and we don't hold controlled access data. But also we're trying to link up to where there are, say, individual level data, genomic data that are held in other data resources. And the cleanest way for us to do that is to map by the publication. It doesn't help us with pre-publication data and it makes data findability kind of challenging. Um, and it's difficult for us to solve that alone. We'd really like to do that in collaboration with IHCC. Um, I personally love the fact that the data dictionaries could be made available. 
Um, we use those. Um, we're using those in some research projects. We're looking at them to try and figure out um, how we can harmonize data. Um, we're harmonizing for particular purposes. Um, quite often we want to know um, which phenotypes from a cohort or which variables contribute to a disease endpoint. And for that, we need a bit of provenance. It's really helpful for us also to know which terminologies we use to code the data because we have to build a mapping strategy. Um, and because we're using it for different purposes in research contexts, a global harmonization strategy is really useful, but it's probably not going to solve all of our problems if we want to say work with a really particular definition of asthma. Um, and then the final sort of request from me is that it's really helpful to have detail on where there are endpoints in big studies, how those are defined and which, which variables contributed to those. And some cohorts do that brilliantly. And I think it's quite a resource um, intensive question. But again, if we want to really understand how to replicate um, analyses across studies, understanding how endpoints say um, things like a diabetes diagnosis uh, are defined if that's possible and the cohorts have the linked data. So that's kind of my wish list coming from a, I'd like to collaborate and I'm a user of data but slightly downstream of people who've actually applied for access. Thank you very much, Ellen. That's, that was fantastic. So I, I'm just going to ask, um, I, I captured four points here. Um, and so I'll start with the last one. So naturally, we're thinking about how our endpoints outcomes defined. That goes beyond, I think, you know, self-reported um, versus, I think, as, uh, from administrative records. Um, but even if they are coming from, say, administrative records, how is I, you're, you're presumably asking also, how is that being defined with from those from those from those types of uh, resources? Is that fair? Yeah, that's great. That's correct. Okay. Um, so, and data dictionaries, I think I've captured a linking to other data sets. I, I put some thoughts here of my, of my own, uh, like registries, exposures uh, as well. Uh, so, so those could be disease registries, cancer registries, and so on, um, but also potentially. So in a sense, what uh, external data sets maybe an individual cohort might be using that might link out to, I don't know, uh, I was just thinking uh, here in Canada, we have something where we have every individual's uh, based on their seven, six digit postal code linked out to an environmental database, right, where we get PM 2.5 and stuff like that. So if that's been done, it'd be great to know about it, I suppose, is, is, is the thought there, right? So is that also fair? Yes, that's, that's a great point. Um, any information that's administrative is incredibly useful. Um, there are data sets in the UK that link out to socioeconomic indices, um, right. things like prison records. Um, some of this stuff is um, private, but it, it actually, where the linkages have been made, it's good to know that you can apply for access. And I can see there's a hand up here as well, Philip, from Chris. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry, Chris. I, yeah, uh, Helen, I'd um, just to help me sort of think through this too. I think mm. in your head, you have some use cases that you're using I as you do. walk through this. And I'd love to hear, can you give what those are just so I can follow along? Sure. So the use cases for the um, dictionaries and coding are to do with us having to be interoperable with data that's coming from you um, indirectly, usually through somebody who's produced something that we want to then capture in, a, in, a, in our knowledge base. Um, and we have to do the mapping. And so being on the receiving end of things that give, people give us um, is viable, but not particularly effective. So we'd really like to look at the data dictionaries for the highly accessed cohorts and figure out a mapping strategy before this stuff arrives, rather than having to do it one off. So that, that's us as a data um, resource operator. And then the other kind of... Um, and then what's the and what's the overarching analysis? Just sort of like is this a GWAS? Like what's what's it's what usually you... a GWAS or um, development and application of a polygenic score? But but the, I think the use cases I have would be consistent with other people using these resources as well. Might be a Mendelian randomization, for example. There are resources that do that. And what's the state of the art for an international standard for phenotypes? Oh, that's a great question. And so it's really I think. There, there are resources appearing which represent lists of phenotypes which are used to define endpoints. There's fee codes in the US, there's one in the UK um, from Health Data Research UK. I, because all the coding and definitions of these are different to start with, I think that there's kind of no universal standard. But we published a paper about um, 18 months ago on, on the things that we thought would be necessary to achieve that. Um, and I can, I can provide that link in the chat in a moment. Have I answered your questions, Chris? 
Yeah, it's, it's a great start. I think it's really helpful for me to imagine if we drive towards that as a use case. Um, I, I like the idea of driving towards apologetic risk score and needing some standards around phenotypes and everything to help me understand mm -hmm. the transect we're going to make through this space to like connect all those dots. Yeah, so when we get those publications or those scores produced, what we get is an endpoint, but we don't really know how the endpoint is defined. And so if you want to compare, say, two two scores, you kind of need to know how the endpoint was defined. And, and that that's kind of a gap in the in that space. And that, that becomes a challenge for us. So we can report what was defined, but if you want to repeat anything or reproduce anything, it's helpful to know what made that up. And it's a very manual process. We're going through it with a bunch of postdocs at the moment in a project called Intervene, which has really highlighted to me some of the challenges in this space. And maybe, and one last, one last question and, and make room for everyone else here. And Philip, maybe this is for you as well, um, is how do we, um, sorry, hold on, I gotta put this question together in the right way. I, I, I'm looking at the different ways that we can bring data together between different partners. And, and Helen, you sort of talked about derived data as a way to do that, to get past sort of the protections that are in place for the row level data for the individual cohorts. Um, and. Uh, and I'm not saying that that should be the only way we do it, right? I'd, I'd love to be able to sort of offer access externally to really merge the data um, between the different programs um, and do it that way. But recognizing the challenge of doing that just in terms of the controls that are in place from the individual countries um, that maybe drive data helps. And so is it enough to have, because to your point, if I just give you, well, here's a bunch of phenotypes and we have some agreement around the phenotypes and here's the genetic data, but there's some provenance that you need as well to rectify the fact that we don't have total agreement around those phenotypes. And like, is there enough, can we can we mask enough the underlying data with just the presentation of like, well, this is how we're defining asthma, but these are the specific contributing factors towards say defining that, that are enough to allow us to put a data set outside of our boundary and still make that useful for people? Yeah, it's a great question. So very often I'm working with derived data, but there are cases where we want access to individual level data and we might want to run some analysis. So, so if I was going to talk about a perfect world, I'd like also to be able to send you um, a workflow to execute um, uh, where we can't port the data out. And some um, cohorts have their own platforms where that's really uh, possible. And in other cases, it's a negotiation and what can be run and what does the what does the environment look like? So with some understanding of what's possible in that space would be really helpful because otherwise it becomes a negotiation with every cohort or every subset inside a cohort. And that's absolutely necessary for, to deal with the, the consent and also the security that's required, but it doesn't help us scale very well. And in certain cases, we might be interested in subsets of populations and just to get the N is very useful. How many people do we have in, in this cohort that demonstrate um, a set of phenotypes that we might be interested to know if it's even worth us running the analysis or asking for a collaboration to do that. So it's sort of an enhanced data discovery model to allow us to make a decision. What I'd love to be able to do is to prioritize myself in terms of the work at all of us, and I'm thinking provincially now, um, is whether I emphasize or prioritize trying to create, say, a common space where we have an overlap of controls, um, where we can merge data sets together, or if I go like, you know what, that's not reasonable to do, that things like SHREMS and things are going to make that so hard, that instead I should focus on publishing a new tier of access to my data that's effectively something I can put outside of that boundary that is even more protected than what I have that would allow international collaboration. Um, and, I, and I'm curious to hear if people think that they understand where the priority should be right now. So, Chris, are you said that there's some, is there some level below derived but above individual? It's a, right, right, yeah, exactly. yeah. I'm not sure more complicated tiers of access are always a solution. I, I, I know there can be in some cases, but because it's hard to define what's your, your requirement sometimes until you actually do it and then discover that you need more data than you received to do the analysis, it, it can be more helpful, I think, to have a space where you can interact. And, and all of the problems you're describing are ones that, that we've experienced in, in other environments, um, in other countries. Um, it's sometimes just unclear what's possible. And then there's a question about, you know, how, how can you engage to say, well, is this going to be possible? And if not, what's a likely solution? Um, I'm always excited about proof of concept. So, you know, try it and see what can happen. And we occasionally work with synthetic data to make that possible so we can make an assessment of, you know, what, what is a good way to do this? 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so I put that as a potential action because something needs to go to be into actionable um, in our in our discussion here. Uh, but I think that that certainly follows with you know, going back to what our cohorts have provided us so, thus far and what can they possibly share with us. And that's kind of how I've outlined it here. You know, can we, you know, I'm just, you know, using another uh, example to some extent, like how 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 derived does the data have to be and how low level or like, can we get like from genotyping data, for example, can we get the full like genotype array? Do we have to get certain subsets of the genotypes? Can we get the actual files coming off the, the, the machine themselves so that you could do other things with that data? So I think that's worth kind of exploring. Um, and if there's a way for us to potentially uh, ask that, that might be a challenge because there's so there's so much variables, so many different things that we could be asking about, whether it's from the omics side, whether it's from the phenotypic side, whether it's from the registry side or outcome side as well. I think that's something that can be explored as well. Uh, Helen, I missed this um, uh, during while well, I was making trying to make notes. So there, you said there was a publication on the uh, uh, back to the harmon data harmonization and standard side. I, I wanted to make sure I captured that part. So Helen, was there a publication um, that you, you that you mentioned? I mentioned the data resource. So I talked about fee codes. Um, right. and is that the one you mentioned? And then there's there's a phenotype library um, that's in, in development in the UK, which uh, full disclosure, I'm involved in the development one. Right. Um, and uh, yes, there is a paper and let me find it. Okay. Um, so that, that, that's interesting. I'm wondering what we can do with that kind of information with our cohorts um, and with the, with, with the portal to some extent as we try to move towards data harmonization. I don't know if we have Melanie and, and um, uh, Thomas here to this morning. I don't think I see them, but in any case, it's one of those things that I thought I felt that um, uh, we should be thinking about over the next while. Um, and is that supported necessarily by uh, organizations like uh, GA for GH, uh, which has as its mandate, of course, as one of its mandates, data standards, um, potentially not necessarily in this space, but uh, it's certainly something that we could uh, explore further here. Yeah, I think kind of common representation of phenotypes and understanding how to group them around things like endpoints would be a great thing to get from um, GA for GH, but there's lots of activity in other spaces. I'm going to email you the link because I can't chat. I think it's been disabled. Philip, Helen, it's Peter. Um, yeah, I, I think the phenotype work is a kind of a natural extension of phenopackets. Um, but one of the things we've recognized is it's an area where we, we need to collaborate with many groups. It's not, whereas, you know, if we're working on <clears throat> main, bringing mainstream genomic data and processing from research into healthcare, it's one set of collaborations. But if we're working on phenotypes, then it's a, it's a broader, uh, group we need to recognize work work with people rather than do it alone <clears throat> Helen I had a question for you which is when you're saying we are you talking about your day job or are you also thinking about things like ICDA um, I have multiple day jobs um, and I think yeah. the things I have asked for here are about how to make the ecosystem hang together a bit, the tech ecosystem and, ecosystem and also the data flow. So I'm coming at this from someone who works in the UK um, and builds infrastructure for health data research. I'm talking about myself as a resource provider um, for particular data resources, GWAS and polygenic scores, but also where we might want to be in five years. So which is sort of the ICDA roadmap as well. Um, and I completely so I agree the, about the, the questions we're getting from funders is very much around just how open, how, you know, what, what we create for IHCC, how much uh, application value can it have beyond IHCC members? So I, I do think we're going to, we're going to need to address that, you know, what's the community, what's the specific community of IHCC and then what are its linkages to groups beyond IHCC? Yeah, I mean, there's a ton of impact from IHCC. And, and I think figuring out what those interfaces are more broadly will be incredibly useful. The fact that IHCC created a portal opened up a whole set of questions for us, which we, we couldn't even conceive until you produced the portal and, and some of the underlying infrastructure and standards. So I, I think that space could be quite nicely explored with some of the stakeholders. And we'd be really happy to be a stakeholder because it's enabling things for us we couldn't do before. Great. 
so just following on on that uh, uh, conversation, so I'm, I'm thinking a little bit of like the GBMI consortium, for example, which I suspect has significant overlap between with the IHCC membership as well as say ICDA activities. Um, so the GBMI for those is the, the global um, meta-analysis, I've forgotten the full acronym actually, global meta-analysis initiative. There's a number of publications that have now appeared uh, exploring GWAS. I think biobanks. Many, in there many of, yeah, are there in, and they're in current, uh, many of them are now appearing in current genomics, sorry, cell genomics. Um, and uh, so those are some great publications there. So, um, so I might just put a note to that as well. I think it's GBMI. That's how it appears on my calendar for. Oh, wow. They've done some really nice um, harmonization work. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to come back to Summit Insights to some extent, uh, because we did have a, a couple of days of or sessions on uh, from uh, people at, at, at Verily, for example, um, with work, potentially working in some being uh, uh, working in cloud environments. Uh, I, I am somewhat curious, and I think this could be a potential action item, as well as uh, get people's thoughts about uh, any sort of barriers they have um, been uh, been exposed to, I suppose, for working in the cloud, um, and how you know. I, I know a survey did go out as to uh, on day one or two about from uh, to see who was working in a cloud environment, who wasn't working in a cloud environment, and it, where is their data currently sitting? Is it on an HPC or something like that? So I think one of the things we did hear was uh, uh, about is, you know, so the, some of the opportunities uh, in working, say, on the Terra platform, for example, which I know the All of Us program is where that's the, where their data is being hosted. UK Biobank is on an AWS platform. Genomics England is being supported by LifeBit, I believe. Um, and on also on an AWS platform. So, um, uh, are there any thoughts or concerns from this working group uh, in terms of uh, IHCC membership uh, or even some of the models that we're suggest thinking or proposing for developing federated platforms uh, uh, moving into that sort of that cloud space, uh, working with a particular cloud environment and so on? I don't know if that was the best way to couch that question but philip I'll, I'll one comment i'll make is that uh it's my intent to ultimately get um all of us to be on the three major platforms um and we're currently working with azure because uh, we're only available right now on google cloud services we're working with azure in conversations with amazon as well um and it's my hope to be there on all of them that has involved some negotiation, um, as you can imagine, because we're looking for them to host um, all of the genomics information, uh, which is substantial sum of data. I was about to say ecumenical on multiple platforms, but in part, yeah, that I think that's that's something that's come up in conversation. If how if you've got APIs built for multiple environments uh, from from different cohorts, um, how do you get them to work together? Would be a challenge if, if more more and more cohorts are starting to be pushed into the commercial cloud space but chris it sounds like you're coming up with a solution for that by just putting all your data uh all of us data hosted on multiple instances is yeah. that, is, is that and, and and the driving and, and two things being driving factors for that one right is that i want them to be in competition with each other um and be pushing hard to see what they can offer in terms of new compute power um to yeah. to these problems and support for different algorithms um, and uh, and then to, to sell researchers on why they should come and do it on their platform. Um, and uh, and then the other reason being that uh, recognizing many researchers are coming with their institution with an existing relationship with one of the cloud providers and maybe negotiated rates that want researchers to have the opportunity to do that and make it easier for them to connect their data to data that they may have um, already on those platforms. But it is something too, collectively the IHCC, right? We may want to enter negotiations collectively um, that maybe we can go in and say, like, if you would like to broadly bring in all of the all of these different member states um, to work on your platform, let's talk. Let's get some agreements on on what compute costs and storage costs are. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. We've been thinking, we've been talking about that quite a lot with regard to omics, right? Uh, collective discussions, but not necessarily in the context of data hosting. Um, uh, Helen. 
so this is a great discussion about the kind of base deployment. And I'd, I'd like to also raise just like a layer up, which is that we'd like our workflows to run across all of the platforms without having to re-engineer for different platforms and to have some basics, you know, so we're using Nextflow, but, you know, other people use different things. You know, we'd like full portability of those workflows. And like a registry of them would also be super useful so we can share them. I mean, obviously we host them in our own Git repos. And I think there's some facilities within some of the platforms for sure. I think Terra does this, but making sure that you could share these in meaningful ways and, and a reasonably low effort from the generator of them across different environments would be great. It should work. Um, it doesn't always. Um, along those lines, we wrote up uh, a set of principles um, for multi-cloud um, that we shared with each one of the vendors to say, these are our expectations of what we want you to be able to do in working with us. And I'm happy to sort of share what we had come up with, but look at maybe we can collectively also then come with one that we can approach the vendors as the IHCC um, and say like, this is what we would ask of you in terms of your support for this sort of work. Sounds great. That does, uh, yeah, so that'd be fantastic, Chris, if you could share that. I think, I think a lot of people would be happy to see that both individually as well as the IHCC in terms of its actual, in, it's a centralized for lack of a better term or federated plans. Um, yeah, I was actually just kind of curious, even uh, within Canada, you know, Canada has 10 provinces, unfortunately or unfortunately, and that's how we support our healthcare systems. And we're constantly having different kinds of discussions with different privacy officers. Cloud environments raises different, uh, in Ontario, I was actually quite surprised at how amenable uh, the privacy officer was for the cloud. In fact, they said they we should have been doing this 10 or 15 years ago. Or And whereas in Manitoba, um, it just says that it'll never not happen in our lifetime. So it's, um, I, I can't imagine that that's not the kind of language we'd be hearing in other places. So uh, it's just a bit of an anecdote. Melanie, good to see you. Hey, hey everybody. So I put it in the in the war war question thingy, but I, I, I don't think that interacts very well with Zoom, but I, I'm going to repeat it here. One of the things that I liked in the, that I think could be a good opportunity for the data group to interact with is the, the cohort in a box starter kit that David and Shimon presented. Um, and I, so we talked about that in the, um, in the data policy group that Nikki Tiffin is leading on as well. And we're saying, you know, it could be a good opportunity. So I don't know if you remember, they had that that set of uh, items that were common and shared across cohorts. So things like um, creating data policy, creating a data roadmap, recruiting participants, the data intake, the data curation, all those things. And we were saying those are the, the aspects that are shared and where we could get high value in standardizing and reproducing. And it sounds like that could be a good place to start with discussion around, you know, which standard do I use to share my data? Where do I share my data? Uh, which cloud infrastructure should I consider? So, you know, uh, possibly a way to start interacting at the very first mile with the court owners and getting them from the get-go to think about data governance and data sharing and things like that. Thank you, Melanie. It's great. I think that's a great point, Melanie. What, one of our real challenges is, you know, time to access data it is still a, a variable which can cause significant challenges for execution of research programs. And, and sometimes, you know, if we can't make things work in a time frame when we're working with multiple cohorts, that, that becomes a blocker for actually using a cohort at all. Yeah, that, that's really true. That's actually one of the, so they highlighted three high impact reproducible potential items and otherwise the, the policies, you know, which data can I share and how, and uh, the data access, you know, leveraging passports and duo and all those. So I think they're working hard on this and it sounds really interesting. So if we were to take that summit insight, Melanie, let's say I'm just going to pick on you for a second, to an actionable priority, uh, what do you think we could potentially do within the IHCC? Would that be just a reaching out for gathering information or would that be something we could disseminate? So my understanding is that the, the cohort, I, I, like the, I like the name, I think they're really good with the name, the cohort in a box startup pack is a, you know, it, it sounds like something small that can easily be bundled and distributed. The, the discussion we had in the data policy group was, you know, how do we 
make sure that the, the requirement for HCC are represented in the starter pack. And I think in the session, uh, Jeff was also suggesting that we could have um, a page on the HEC website where we would point to those resources. So I think there's a little bit of collaboration slash outreach that needs to happen uh, and making sure that what we have is represented in there and that conversely, they point to HEC as a good place to register your cohort if you're looking for global impact, for example. Melanie, I, I wonder for the diversity of cohorts in IHCC, you know, is a feasibility analysis of, of which bits the, of these are kind of potentially usable by the, the, the real variety of cohorts? Is that something that goes along with that? Um, I think I don't know. I think I would, I, I see that Nikki is online. So I think I would maybe point to Nikki because we had a bit of discussion around that. Uh, in the LWASI project. So I don't know, Nikki, if you wanted to jump in. Sorry, can you repeat the question? It was my question, Nikki. So, so my question was, um, in terms of the variety of cohorts and, you know, cohorts are differently resourced and have different levels of um, maturity in lots of directions. If, if something like cohort in a box is shared, is there some matching feasibility analysis to understand when that might work for the variety of cohorts or, or when it might not? So I unfortunately missed the cohorts in a box talk. So um, I don't really know. I've been in, in Addis, I've literally just landed about half an hour ago. Um, so I don't know, I, I will have to look at the, the video for the cohorts in a box and, and see um, you know, what, what's feasible in our setting. Yeah, I think the, the thing I was thinking about, Nikki, I'm sorry for, for jumping on you, is the when we had the, the discussion with the the South African and African cohorts, we, we brought in a little you know fair toolkits and having kind of a a ready to assess tool that you know cohort can answer a question and say yes I can do that, no I cannot do that. I think that was really powerful because it makes it easy for each of the court owner to assess, you know, it's okay, I can do that, or no, I don't have the resources to do that. And also identify the next priority for them. So I think bringing that back to the court in the box, if you say, you know, okay, most of the time court are able to say, this is what I'm trying to do. This is my program mission. This is what I want to get out of it. But if we were able to say, okay, next you need to think about data policy. Have you thought about uh, regulatory aspects, have you thought about data governance, have you thought about how you're going to share your data, have you looked into this, so uh, kind of having, you know, a, a, a checkbox, like scoring form type of thing, and guideline on what things they need to think about, I think that would increase the feasibility. Yeah, I think it would be useful, because it's just sort of a guideline, and, um, you know, you could check how much you conform with that, um, and how much work you still have to do. Sometimes you don't know what you haven't done yet if you don't know because it isn't a list. That's a great point. Um, yeah, I, think I find that really helpful because we've been trying to work with people in, in resource pool settings to understand where they're blocked and it's a very difficult discussion to have without some kind of framework. So that, that feels really helpful. Thank you for sharing that, Melanie. Um, I tried to just a moment ago get onto Hoover or Hova or whatever, however you pronounce that, to see if there were comments. I was terrified of trying to left leaving the Zoom and going over there, and so I didn't see anything. So Melody, if you if, if you've made other comments there, or if anyone's made any comments on that platform, um, please uh, bring them up here or not, perhaps. I didn't see anything, by by the way, when I, I went over there. So no, there's nothing. I couldn't see anything else. So. Yeah. I'll let you know if I see something. Okay, super. And Melanie, I know you sent me some uh, points uh, via email. Um, did I? Was there anything that we could capture here um, that I haven't raised yet? Sorry. Let me pull the email. I do not remember <laughs> what I said there. Right. <laughs> it's too I'm early sure. in the morning for us. But uh, yeah. 
<laughs> well, uh, yeah, it's even earlier here in California. Um, uh, Melanie, uh, while she's looking that up, uh, I had one more question about the use cases. Uh, is And I'd be curious about what are the problems that specifically can only really be solved by going through this sort of collaboration across the IHCC? Um, and so I'm imagining sort of rare disease is the first thing that comes to mind for me, where someone's not going to have the power within one of the cohorts and needs to sort of go across them. Um, I also, I, I do think about, uh, there was a really fascinating talk at the NIH not long ago about someone who found a problem that ended up being uh, auto, uh, anti-cytokine autoantibodies, um, and uh, it was specific to fungal exposure in Thailand. Um, and so it was like, yeah, all his patients in the U.S. were from Thailand, and he ended up having to collaborate with people in Thailand to get enough cases to understand what was going on. Um, and so are there other sort of cases that are unique or special that we will be able to solve collectively uh, more than any individual uh, member could? So I think that's a great way, Chris, to, to emphasize the need for having this kind of collective. Let's, we could take, yeah, we can just keep going to, I don't know, pancreatic cancer is a rare enough cancer that even within a national cohort, you may not be powered, particularly for incident cases. So uh, I was, uh, uh, suggesting earlier that we need, may need a pilot activity. Let's pick a couple of rare diseases that maybe the, the Thai fungal thing would be, is a little bit, uh, you know, but may, we could take something like a pancreas, like a rare disease or a rare cancer, see what is missing in terms of our operations going forward uh, for say the Atlas. Um, and how do we kind of, if we wanted to ask that question, what do we need to build um, that might be the one way to kind of go forward with what is it that we're still needing to build. There's a lot we still need to build um, through the data standards infrastructure working group um, rather than kind of build something and then see, well, we, we still can't actually ask that question. So Helen, you have your, your hand up. Yeah, I completely agree with the kind of the power scenario. And I think it's not just rare disease. It, it's also power in different, different ethnic groups. So um, you know that we talk to people in our diversity working group, the GWAS catalog about, you know, why we're seeing so few um, things outside non-white populations. Um, and there's this massive bias to, and I'm sure this was discussed at IHCC, but, but we know that those studies get done, but they're quite lowly powered, but they just don't get shared. They don't get in the publication. Nobody shows the data. There's kind of no ability to integrate things across different um, ethnicities. And that's, that's a huge kind of missed opportunity. Um, and, and if we keep doing that, things won't get any better. Um, so just knowing I'm going to go, we don't have hardly anything in funding opportunities except for we need external funding, which is a completely banal kind of statement, but it's true. Um, but it's always difficult to get funding for operational support, particularly from agencies. But it's not that hard if we potentially uh, leverage, uh, say, a cohort or a set of cohorts or the IHCC activity to ask a scientific question. So I, that may be an opportunity through pilot activity, or th it's well, how, how we might couch it as a pilot activity, but to say we can, you know, support through uh, through grants, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a specific disease need, right? Um, and so that could potentially be something that somebody um, could look at here in the context of funding opportunities. Somebody needs to write a grant, though. Yeah. Maybe it, it, along those lines, uh, working with foundations, disease foundations, who may be willing to help support looking at rare disease, for example, um, could be interesting in terms of funding whatever direction that's going in. Yeah, rare diseases, orphan diseases. Yeah. Do you think there's an opportunity to, so, you know, to Chris's point, I think we could really do with a nice success 